My name is John Barrows and I'm with Jay Barrows Consulting. We do sales training consulting for some of the fastest growing companies in the world like Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, Dropbox, Google. And I train sales reps on tips and techniques and thankfully in the SaaS world it kind of keeps me on my toes, right? Because not only does SaaS evolve and innovate from a technology standpoint, but SaaS also tends to innovate quite a bit from a sales standpoint. And so if I'm training my clients on the same stuff I was training them on two years ago, I'm probably not going to get a renewed contract. So it forces me to stay up to date. And one of the things that I've been paying a lot of attention to right now is, is the death of the average sales rep. You know, I'm actually watching sales reps die a pretty painful death these days because most of them are just going through the motions. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you today about and hopefully uh, have you take away a few nuggets that you can apply or at least thought process that you can apply so that we can stay relevant here in sales as technology starts to take us over. And really what it revolves around is the context of sales evolution. So with that, I'd like to kind of talk you through a few things just in general that are, are, I guess I'm paying attention to, and, and I think we should too, all of us should, because we're in a position right now where technology is just, it's moving so fast that it used to displace some jobs, and but it would also create some jobs, right? We're in a world now where technology is just going to start erasing jobs. So if we look at this, I mean, as an example, a Tesla up there, I bought an $80,000 car last year online. I didn't talk to a single sales rep. Now it's on lease, so I didn't pay all 80 grand, but I didn't talk to a single sales rep. Right? I went online, I configured it, and they drove it to my house, and that was it. You know, I went to the movies the other day, and uh, Spider-Man, there was a promo for the new Spider-Man coming out, and it was fully animated, and it looked real. And, and so now blockbuster movies like Spider-Man are coming out without actors. Yeah, they'll have the voice and stuff like that, but not the actual actors. So that industry is going through huge disruption and then that ridiculous picture there is me actually going in a warehouse where it's one of the first in, in the country and one of the biggest in the country here in Massachusetts where I got a headset a full VR headset on an actual you know a gun and a backpack and me and a group of friends are walking around shooting aliens in a fully immersed virtual reality world and yes that is an Elvis suit don't ask about that that's a long story but but my point is is all this stuff's happening from a technology standpoint and technology is evolving and it's getting more and more personalized with artificial intelligence, specifically as it relates to sales. So that's what's happening from a tech standpoint. But sales reps are actually going in the opposite direction. Sales reps are using these tools and technologies not as efficiency tools, but as automation tools. And they're just going through the motions, you know, pressing play on, on demos and cranking out template emails and asking bad questions. All that stuff's going to get replaced here in the not so distant future. And, you know, with artificial intelligence, I used to kind of be freaking out a lot more about it than I am now. But what I've come to realize is, specifically with artificial intelligence, it's going to make good sales reps great, great sales reps incredible, and average sales reps irrelevant, right? Because this is what sales reps are doing. This is the state of sales right now and how, again, we need to evolve because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble, right? You have SDRs cranking out template emails, right? They're doing the, hey, I'm a leading provider of, did you get my first email? Bubbling this one up to the top and why aren't you responding? And then the inevitable breakup email, right? And these are just template cadence, no thought, nothing, right? And then we have AEs or sales reps who are out in the field or, you know, taking those leads giving demos, just press and play on demos, like droning through presentations and customers not engaged at all. Not to mention the SDR or BDR to AE handoff is completely broken because there's really, there's no, there's no standard best practice for how you transition a lead from an SDR to an AE. And so inevitably what happens is the SDR has a, you know, asks a bunch of questions or whatever, qualifies the account hopefully, and then flips it to the AE. And then when the AE gets on the phone, they, pretty much ask the same questions and they go through the same process and the client's now super frustrated with that because nobody likes to tell the story tw you know twice and then we have customer success right and customer success they're doing their typical QBRs where they go through the you know the the slide decks of all the stats and stuff like that that clients really don't care about and then when renewal comes up they got that 90 60 30 day and then hey please sign up now we'll give you a discount and oh, by the way, that handoff is broken from sales to CSM or sales to account management. That is because all that work that the sales reps did and throughout the whole sales process, 
rarely gets documented and so the expectations of the client are usually misset and now the customer success has to clean it up. So you have all that, that whole mess happening and that's been going on for years now ever since predictable revenue came out right and, and Salesforce kind of built that model of specialization this is where we've been and it's actually gotten worse. And then we have marketing and marketing is doing their thing right they're blasting out content they're flooding the market with content they're starting to get an understanding that you can't do that anymore and that's why account-based marketing has come out you know to me it's always funny you know account-based marketing to me is really just a realization from marketing that they got to stop spamming people right but they're putting all this stuff out there and the relationship between sales and marketing is broken I mean, I have a marketing degree. That's what I graduated with. I got immediately into sales, and I've been hearing about the sales and marketing divide since I got out of college. 22 years later, I'm still hearing about the exact same sales and marketing divide. And then you have the customer, and all of this is broken as it relates to the customer. Like I said, this model of predictable revenue of segmenting roles, that is not customer-centric in any way, shape, or form. Again, nobody likes to be handed off five times before they get to talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And by the way, if you follow with marketing, blasting all this stuff and, and educating people and you follow, uh, what is it, um, Challenger Sale, they talk about by the time somebody comes to us, they're already 60 to 70% of the way through the sales process. So if they're already doing that and then we're starting at scratch, like, if, you know, tell me about your business type of stuff, no wonder they're frustrated. The other thing is they do not follow a linear sales process. They kind of come in and come out whenever they feel like it, and they might have to restart, bring different people in. But we in sales are still treating it as this, you know, linear sales process that they go through, which they don't. And then you add social to the mix, and now you just got a complete mess, right? Because sales reps are doing it one way, marketing's doing it another way, and the customer's just sick of hearing from it. And so we have all this stuff happening, right, from a per people standpoint, and sales reps and process and all this structure going through. And yet you have now technology that's getting so much more advanced, so much more targeted, so much more, you know, personalized. And so the question I think we need to ask ourselves these days is what can we do that a computer can't? Because if you, if you can't answer that question based on your role, then you better start looking for a job or you, you got to sit there and wonder how much longer they're going to pay me to do this, right? And that question is getting harder and harder to answer these days. It's not just, oh yeah, you know, I can do this stuff. No, 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 no. If you're watching what's happening with virtual reality and that stuff, you can get really personalized and computers can actually read people better than people can. So the answer, or at least something that I'd love for you all to think about, because this is really what I'm trying to wrap my head around and, and figure out how I can do across every aspect of my business and in sales and engagement, I think the answer is context. And I say that because, uh, and I saw this from Gary Vaynerchuk, and by the way, if you're not following Gary Vaynerchuk, I highly recommend you do. You know, one of the things he said was, you know, everybody talks about content is king, content is king. He said, fine, if content is king, then context is God. And that got me thinking about marketing versus sales. Marketing is content, sales is context. If we as sales professionals are not putting any context around our content, we're no different than marketing, right? Blasting out template emails. That's not content. That's not context. That's content. I can do that better with Marketo, Eloqua, Pardot, pick one of them, right? Pressing play on demos, all that stuff, you know, just sharing stuff on social without an opinion. That is all content. And I do not need a human being to do that at this point. So three of the things that I just mentioned, I want to dive into a little bit deep here so you can walk away and, and apply this to your day-to-day -day activities. And the three areas that I look at context are email contact strategies, social and personal brand building, and presentations and demos. So let's take each one of these at a, at a time. Email contact strategies. You know, there's all these cool tools out there right now, like SalesLoft, Outreach.io, uh, Tout App, Yesware. And what they're supposed to be is sales efficiency tools, right? They're supposed to help a sales rep be more efficient at their job. But the problem is is sales reps are using them as sales automation tools. They're just tank, taking template emails that marketing gives them or whatever, putting them into those cadences and press and play and just letting it ride with no thought to it, with no context around those emails. That to me, I do not understand what the difference between that and Marketo Elico Pardot is. I just don't. And I don't know why I need to pay a sales rep 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollars a year to do this. That is content. Now context is taking some of the content that marketing shares with us 
and putting a little flavor on top of it about why it's relevant to that person that you're reaching out to. So here's an example. In my training, you know, there's this one training technique that, that Jeff Hoffman came up with a long time ago uh, from my previous days at Basho, and it's called the Why You, Why You Now email technique, which is effectively going on somebody's website, doing some research on them, and saying, hey, I was on your website, I noticed, and looking for a trigger, right? You open up a new office, you launch a new product, whatever that is. The reason that prompted me to reach out to you is because a lot of our clients who, you know, leverage our solutions when that type of thing happens, and this is the result they get, who can I talk to about it? So it's about them, about you, call to action, keep it under a, you know one or two scrolls on an iPhone, and there it is. Now that approach has kind of been bastardized over the years because a lot of people have taken a very generic approach and are just cranking it out as template with, hey, here's what we do, here's three clients, who can I work with? But the personalization still works um, if done right. So, But we have to create some efficiencies because I can't spend a half an hour writing every email that I want to write. I mean, I wish we could, but realistically, we're probably being asked to do 20, 30, 40, 50 dials a day or whatever it is, so I can't spend a half an hour writing every email. So here's a way to make that efficient as it relates to context content. Pick five triggers that your business um, can add value to, right? Or your solution can add value to. So you open up a new office, you launch a new product, you merge with another company, you're growing, um, whatever those are, whatever those triggers are, right? Find five of them. And then come up with messaging about how your solution addresses that, right? Specifically, because every, look, every time somebody goes through a merger and acquisition, you can kind of say the same thing, right? Every time somebody launches a new product, you can kind of say the same thing. So we can create templates, but I don't mean templates to be blasted out to a million people. I mean templates to be used from an efficiency standpoint. So as an example, I have a why you, why you now new office template, a why you, why you now acquisition template, a why you, why you now new role template, and a why you, why you now growth template. And then what I do is I listen to my top accounts through social listening tools like LinkedIn Sales Navigator and Owler and those type of things. And I listen for mergers and acquisitions on my top tier accounts. And then when I come across, when I get pinged, hey, so-and-so just merged with or acquired, whatever it is, I open up my merger and acquisition template and scrub it up a little bit and fire it off. And I've just done some really high quality prospecting in a very efficient way by putting my context around that. Because the template reads, hi, Bill, I was doing some research and I noticed this. And that's the part we have to customize, right? That's the part that has to show the client why they should continue reading this. And the only thing people care about is themselves, right? So don't start your emails off with, I'd like to introduce myself to you or leading provider, we're the leading provider of. Nobody cares about that. The only thing they care about is them. So start with them and then back it up with you. So the why you, that's about them. That's the part that you have to customize. The why you now, that message though, that can be pretty standard. So now, again, I can crank through super highly customized emails in a very efficient way by templatizing my messaging, but leaving a little bit of flavor on top to make sure that I put my context around it and make it relevant to you. I'll give you a few more examples of con as it relates to emails and stuff like that. For instance, I want, if, if, I gotta, if I'm working in a company and I'm, uh, my marketing department's sending out template email, you know, every, to everybody, whatever, I wanna be put on that list. I want to make sure that I get the marketing emails that go out. Um, and those, mar by the way, I also want those marketing emails not to have my name on them, right? Because I don't want that client to get inundated with emails from John Barrows and from when it's obviously marketing and templated stuff. And then me reach out to you, you know, a couple of weeks later, very personalized. I'm probably already in the spam filter, right? But I want to be put on that list. And then what I do is when I see a piece of content that goes out by marketing to the mass audience, I'm going to go find the five to 10 clients in my territory that I want to stay top of mind with and I think could get value out of that piece of content. And I'm going to send it to them directly and say, hey, you know what? I'm sure you probably saw this from our marketing department. I was reading through this piece the other day. I thought it was really interesting. And based on our previous conversations, this is why I thought it was interesting to you. So you might want to take a look at it. Okay. Right? Or here's another one, webinars. <laughs> I can't stand webinars. You know, I, well, you know what, you know how many webinars I've signed up for? Hundreds. You know, how, you know how, many, how many I attend? Zero. You know why? Because I know right after that webinar, I'm going to get the email, sorry you missed the webinar, here's the link to it, it's going to go to my things to read folder and I'm never going to look at it again. But if, but if you're a rep, what you can do is, say somebody signs up, or say they don't sign up, and that email goes out with the link to the webinar. Again, take your five to 10 top prospects that you're really trying to stay on top of and stay top of mind and try to earn their business. 
take that webinar, forward it to them and say, hey, you know what, um, based on your role or based on what we've talked about before, um, I, know, I noticed you missed the webinar, uh, but based on what I know about you, if you actually start listening to this webinar at around minute 15 and go from minute 15 to 32, like that's really where the core value of this webinar is because they talk about some very tactical things there. I thought you might find that interesting. If a rep would have ever do that to me, I would, all, I, would, I would fall out of my chair and be like, I, I wouldn't even know what to, how to respond for crying out loud. So those are ways to put context around the content from an email and a contact strategy standpoint. Now let's talk about social and brand building. This is extremely important, same reason, right? To build your personal brand is an incredibly important thing to do in today's world because your personal brand is also what's gonna keep us relevant and, and not getting replaced by robots. But I can't stand it when people, you know, marketing departments take their marketing engine and tie it to every sales rep's Twitter account and blast out tweets from all of them, right? I, I don't need a sales rep for that. Just sign up, just create some fake Twitter accounts and do it that way and do the Autobot stuff that way. But as a rep, what I wanna do is, I wanna, I wanna read that information and I wanna have an opinion about it. And this is, by the way, this is where social selling flipped for me, right? Because at 42 years old, I was like, great. You know, when social selling first came out, I was like, great, yet another thing I gotta do to be successful in sales. Fantastic, add it to the list. And the whole idea of tweeting and posting and all that stuff was just absurd to me, just to get a following, right? But where it flipped for me was when I started looking at it as educating myself first. So look, using all these tools like Feedly and all these different things out there to, to learn about stuff that I should be learning about. Stuff like, you know, to improve my business acumen, like stuff about my clients, stuff about the industry that I focus on, stuff about the personas that I sell to. So I set up all that information to come to me so I can read that. And then when I read an article that I think is actually valuable, I take the extra two seconds, I put some context around it about why I think it's interesting, and I share it out there on LinkedIn and Twitter. So for instance, hey, really good article here, really good ebook here, you know. Um, if you're a VP of sales in the SaaS industry trying to integrate social selling into your routine, you should take a look at pages three, eight, and 12 because there's some tactical stuff that you can do immediately after reading this article. It's like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. But don't just retweet stuff just to, again, show that you're social. Have some context around that because that's what people care about. And by the way, you do not have to be the content creator, okay? You have to be the content curator. Because there's so much content out there, don't worry about being the cut. Don't worry about starting a blog or you know vlog or, or or whatever, right? If you want to, by all means, I recommend it. But you don't have to, right? But what you have to do is you have to take that content that's out there and have an opinion about it. So here's an example. I write a blog post that goes out once a week. It's, you know, and I've been writing it for five, about five years now on a weekly basis, and I'm running out of stuff to say. Is stuff to say, it, it, and it's really hard to stay consistent with writing a blog post. Because a blog post, usually it takes me about, probably I'd say about an hour or two hours to write a really well thought out, really good blog post. And then I send it to my team and they SEO optimize it. Uh, then they get it in the right format to post and then they put it out there. And, um, you know, so it takes probably, I don't know, four or five hours to put a fully, you know, vetted blog post out there for me. So say I take that time, I put those four hours in and I post it out there and you're following me. And you read my article. And you really like it. And you're like, hey, really good article here by John, da 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 And you post, you retweet it or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, one of your followers sees that tweet and reads my article. Who do they thank? You. I might get another follower. I might say, you know, oh, cool stuff. Let me follow this guy. But out on Twitter, they're like, they're not saying thanks, John Barrows, for, you know, putting that thing together there for me. They're thanking you for sharing it. So again, you do not have to be the content creator. You need to be the content curator. Right? So that's how you do context with social over content. And the last thing I'll mention here is kind of these days my least far favorite part of the sales process, which is the presentation of the demo. The reason I hate this is because every single demo is exactly the same. Every rep, what they'll do, and because I go through probably, by the way, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a two-man show at this point. Um, I hired uh, this kid, Morgan Ingram, to help me out, help me scale my business. But up until recently, I was a one-man show, so I'm not really a good lead for anybody, right? Um, but I go through a lot of demos because all these uh, sales technologies, these new tools, they want to show them to me so I could potentially introduce them to my client base, right? So I go through, I don't know, three, four, five demos on a weekly basis, and I want to because I want to see the new technology out there. But man, every single demo is exactly the same. So they pick up the phone for a scheduled call and they say, John, is this still a good time? First of all, 
Do not ask me if it's still a good time for a scheduled call. Why would you want to give me that out? Actually, you know what? I got to go to the bathroom right now. Why don't we reschedule this, right? So they say, is this still a good time? Okay, well, I got about a 30 minute demo here that I'd like to go through with you. And if you have any questions as we go through it, just let me know, okay? And then they press play and they go through every single slide like they were badged for in boot camp. And then they pause intermittently and they go, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Anybody ever said no to that question, by the way? Anybody ever been like, holy crap, what you just said there blew my mind, right? And by the way, even if they say yes, does that tell you whether or not it made sense? <laughs> for me, I mean, I used to say that all the time, by the way. Um, but for me, I realized that the majority of the time I was saying, does that make sense? I was actually asking myself that question. Because I would have been droning on for 10, 15, 20 minutes on a presentation or something like that. And kind of feeling like I was losing the crowd or whatever. And I'd pause and be like, does that make sense? Because I really don't think it did. or you know, and, and your nod kind of gave me the assurance to keep going through this, right? And then at the end... By the way, if you ever go through one of those canned demos, um, if you ever hear this word, at the end of one of your demos, you know you've done a miserable job. And it's the word digest. You know, it's like, hey, John, you know what? I'm going to need a little time to digest what you just told me there. If you ever hear that, stop and apologize to the person that you just wasted their time. Because it is our job to help them digest the information. If they walked out of that conversation more confused than they were walking into the conversation, we've done a miserable job as sales reps. So context content, what I want to do is I'm going to send you an agenda. Say we got a demo coming up here. I'm going to send you an agenda. I'm going to say, hey, I'm looking forward to our meeting tomorrow. In order to get the most out of our time together here, I put together a brief agenda. Could you do me a favor and email me back? Let me know what else you'd like to add. And in there, I'm actually going to force the conversation to start with goals, priorities, initiatives, bigger picture stuff so that I can tailor this demo, okay? Now, hopefully I've qualified it beforehand and I'm not just giving unqualified demos. Um, so what I wanna do is whatever that qualification information that I got or my SDR or BDR got beforehand, I wanna actually put that in there. Is this stuff still accurate, okay? So then when you start the presentation or when you get on that phone with that person, again, don't say, do you still have 30, you know, I'm sorry, don't say, is this still a good time? But what you can say is, do you still have 30 minutes? Do you have a hard stop at two o'clock? Because I do want to know that, right? Because if you have a hard stop at two o'clock, that means your brain around 150, 155, your brain's going to start moving in a different direction. So I do want to know if you have a hard stop. And then I start saying, okay, I'm you know, sure you probably didn't see the agenda I sent out yesterday. I just want to make sure that we get the most out of our time together here. Look, I got about a 30 page slide deck here. Demo usually takes about 30 minutes. I don't want to go through that whole thing with you. I just want to really focus on what's most important to you. So if we could start here by talking about kind of really what do you want to get out of today's presentation? Help me understand from a business standpoint, where are you trying to go? How are you trying to scale? Those type of things, right? And then based on that five, 10 minute preface conversation, then you start going through your presentation and you highlight the areas that they were most interested in. And you kind of diminish the ones that they weren't or kind of skip through them to a certain degree. And then instead of saying, does that make sense? You pause intermittently and say, okay, you know, I just showed uh, that, that component of our solution is actually something that is um, that you said was a priority for you. So um, could you explain to me how you see that fitting into your existing workflow? Or could you tell me how that, com could you share with me how you see that comparing to what you're doing now? Because the way that you compare it to how you're doing it now and the way you explain to me, right, tells me everything I need to know on whether or not it made sense or not, okay? And then at the end, you close it out and, and you know, you make sure you get your defined next step. But, but those demos are the ones that engage with people. The ones that we press play, I don't need a sales rep to do that. As a former marketer, I can come up with a better presentation than you can if all you're going to do is press play, right? I mean, I can set up a presentation, put it online, let you go through it and take you on a journey. If you, if you click on this, it goes this way. If you click on this, it goes this way. And I can run the analytics on the back end to figure out which pages you stayed on the most and send you relevant content around that stuff. I mean, that marketing can do that better than us. Sales, we have to have a conversation with people. We have to have context around it and help people digest the information, okay? So those are the three main areas. Um, that, that I'm looking at as a danger zone for, for sales reps is the email cadence approach, the personal brand building, and the presentations and demos. And if we think about putting context around that content, we have a chance at staying relevant. So I encourage you all as you go back to the office and you start thinking about how you can improve and how you can stay relevant in today's world, look at every single aspect of the sales process, of your business, of the tools that you use, 
and ask yourself, is this content? And how, how can I put my context around this to put the human element there? I hope you got some value out of this. Um, this context thing is something that I really do think is that important to pay attention to. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, you're more, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I just I said earlier, I hired this kid, Morgan Ingram. He's 25 years old, SDR, cranking it. He's doing a great job at building his own personal brand. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to elevate the profession of sales. Because right? I firmly believe that when sales done right, it's the greatest profession in the world. When done wrong, it's the worst. So let's do it right, all right? Let's make it happen. Have a great day, everybody.